Amen. So all I have to say is, wow, what a turnout. You know, it's Friday night. You could have been anywhere else. You could have been celebrating. You could have been going out to the movies. You could have been doing all kinds of other stuff, but you chose to be here tonight to invest and to support. And again, when I shared about that, our marriages are not our own. That is vital because we have to think about, you know, when we go through stuff, when we're struggling in our marriages, do you think we think about, oh yeah, this is going to affect my children or that young couple that's looking at our marriages and if they see us struggling and ready to give up, they'll say, yeah, it's okay. We'll just start over again. We don't think about those things. These are the things we like to call the um, undetermined. What's that? I'm sorry. Lost my train of thought there. Yeah, what was it? Un- yeah. Un- what? Circumstances. Yeah. What is it you call it? I'm sorry. You lost me. You lost me. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> unintended consequences. Und- there yes, you go. As soon as I mentioned the Lord, he brought it back. Yes. Okay, so these are unintended consequences, right, that we just don't think about. You know, Michelle and I, you know, when we were going through the thick of it in our marriages, you know, I didn't think about my two girls and how they were going to have to suffer and endure because I chose not to take authority over these issues in areas of my life. And that's what we want to talk about tonight, about taking authority. And again, you might have a really good marriage, no issues, nothing wrong, but your marriage has been created. It is a covenant for a specific purpose. Amen. Yeah. Um, I know it's called, it's time, you know, uh, when we were worshiping, the Lord brought back to me a dream I had years ago. And it was, um, it was me. I was, I was the first person in my family to really be saved. We sort of grew up in a Catholic background. So we had this reverence for God, but not a relationship. You know, um, we felt like we could just live our lives. However, but I, I did genuinely have a reverence. I knew he saw everything I did. Um, but the dream that I had was, um, I went into my mom and dad's house and, um, and I walked up into my mom's room and she was sleeping in bed and I pulled her covers off. But when I pulled her covers off, there was two snakes laying in the bed with her. Um, and I yelled, I said, I yelled out, it's time to my mom. And when I said it though, my voice was like a trumpet. Like, I, I'm not joking, it was like a trumpet. It had like this power and authority. And it said, it's time. And there was two snakes laying in the bed. She was sleeping. Um, but I knew what it represented. It was time for her to wake up from her slumber, right? Our whole family, actually. Because when I first got saved, I'm telling you, um, I read Deuteronomy 28, and it talked about the blessing and cursing of God, right? And it says in Deuteronomy 28, verse 1, If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God, and do all that he's commanded you this day, then all these blessings will come upon you and overtake you. But then it jumps down, I think verse 16, now it talks about the curses. And it goes, no lie, all the way to 68 about the curses. When I read that, Um, And in verse 45, I think it stops there and it says that all these signs will be a sign and a wonder upon you for all generations. And I looked at that and I'm telling you, there was one that said, you will beget sons and daughters, but you won't enjoy them, right? Is what it says. And I was like, ooh, ouch. Because at that time, my mom and dad, uh, my brother and sister, I had a sister who's deaf. She was in El Salvador. This man wanted to marry her. He barely spoke any English. She's deaf. We knew what he was doing. Um, And so she's trapped there. And it was when it was upheaval there in El Salvador. Um, she, She couldn't get out. And then my brother and my sister, they were uh, on drugs. They were drug addicts. My parents had to lock their bedroom doors. Um, and because and, every time you turn around, something was missing. Something was gone. And so literally we had to, um, when I read that, I was at my parents' house and I told them that. My mom and dad got mad at me. They got mad at me. And, and, but I saw the realness in it. I'm like, this is the word of God and it's manifested in our family. Like, look at this. And my dad left out of the kitchen and went upstairs and and it's funny because uh, Andre just prophesied something over me about me being um, somebody that will go after people to take them out of the grip of the enemy. I followed my father to his room. <laughs> and I literally stood at the door, the crack of the door, and I said, Dad, 
Just read it, read it, and just repent. The Bible says only acknowledge your iniquity and that you transgress against the Lord and he'll heal you. He'll take you one of a city and two of a family and bring you to his holy mountain. I said, Dad, just acknowledge it. That's all he's asking. I said, just acknowledge it. So jumping back to the dream that I had about my mom saying, it's time. It was such a manifestation because I was that person that I would, Pastor Mark called it um, like a thorn in the flesh. I am a thorn in the flesh for, to some people, just so you know, including my husband sometimes. <laughs> but, but literally, I reached in the bed. There was two snakes. One I knew in my dream was a boa constrictor. And I took that snake and I grabbed it. And I remember feeling it in real life. And I grabbed it and I broke it. And I could feel the, the breaking of it and hear it internally. Um, and I knew what it represented, um, that boa constrictor, right? Because a boa constrictor will come and constrict its prey and swallow it whole, right? Well, then the second snake was this little small snake, small, its face was like a cobra's head and the tail was like a tadpole. So I go to grab it and I'm thinking, it's small, it's not a big deal, but I went and I grabbed it and I took to break it. And when I went to break it in half, its mouth lunged out, grabbed my wrist and bit me. And I could feel it in my dream. Have you ever had that where you felt something in real life? And I was literally trying to shake it off, but I broke it. I was able to break it and I went on about my business. There was more to the dream, but God showed me that he chose me, right? To break these generational curses in our family. But I knew the boa constrictor represented jealousy, right? That jealousy, um, the constrictor will like choke you, right? Choke and suck the life out of you, just swallow you whole. Then the second one was my mom's short temper that I got bit by that thing. And, and literally, uh, I know you guys can't, can't see it, but I do have a scar on my wrist because I put my hand through a plate glass window fighting my sister because of my anger. I had such rage and anger um, and I almost lost my hand. And so in this dream, I kept hearing the Lord tell me I need to go to the hospital, um, but I could function, but I could see that two of my fingers were dying, right? Like gray, like dead corpse. And... Um, and literally, uh, I knew what that represented because I did. I had that rage um, in me, that, that total anger. So going back to all of this while we were worshiping the Lord and this coming to my mind that it's time, that it is time. My mom was sleeping and I pulled her covers off and exposed those things and said, no more. It's no more. God's no longer going to cover anymore. He's going to start exposing stuff if we don't repent because he loves you. He loves you. And that's what we're here tonight, that it's time. No more sleeping in your sin. No more sleeping and just ignoring the things, the responsibilities that God has called you to and what he's called you to be as a father and a mother, um, gatekeepers in your house. What are you allowing in your house? So that's what we're here for, is that going after that. We think, oh yeah, getting your authority, like it's not about being big and bad and I got this authority, right? Because you can be big and bad, but inside you're weak and you fall every time you turn around. And it's like God wants to strengthen you by his word. And so, go ahead, babe. Tag team. <laughs> Somebody say it's time. It's time. Okay, so let me check all of our notes. None of what she said was in here. Yes, it okay, was. <laughs> so, thank you, Holy that's, Spirit. Yes. You know, it's interesting. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry, babe. That's okay. Um, Ron, <laughs> you mentioned about COVID in the last year. Um, one of the other things that COVID did was it really revealed and exposed marriages and what, were, what was in the heart of people. Yes. Um, I heard this message last March, I believe it was, and it was right when things were starting to get heated in the COVID uh, time frame there. And this preacher, he preached a message and he says, this is a test. This is a, a test for God's people. And the test is not supposed to teach us anything. It's supposed to reveal what is already in your heart. And that's why we've seen, you know, when people are out of jobs, guess what? They've got more time at home. They've got more time around their wives. They have more times around their kids. And if there were no investments in their marriage, right? If there was no work poured into their marriage, then there's nothing to draw from. Yeah. You're actually working from a deficit. And that's why we've seen so many marriages seek help, seek counseling, mm -hmm. 
and hanging on by a thread. And this is what we're talking about. When we say we're taking authority, it is time to take authority. Our God-given authority. The Lord, the word says that God has given us authority, power and authority, right? He has given us the keys to the kingdom of heaven, right? And so what happens when we leave our house and we forget our keys, right? We can't do anything, right? And that's how marriages have been, is that they have given up or relinquished their God-given authority. Now, speaking for men, right? Me as a man, I, I lived that firsthand, you know, when I allowed Michelle to be the spiritual leader of the home for years, right? I, she was the one that disciplined all the kids, right? And so there was such an imbalance there. There's no wonder why we had all kinds of chaos in our home. And it wasn't until I decided no more, no more. I see what this is doing. I see what it's doing to our family. And I saw the yoke that it placed on Michelle because this was not a mantle that she was created to have yeah. as a spiritual leader of the home. It's a mantle for him, a yoke for me. Right? Exactly. For the man, he is the head and he's supposed to carry that. And so it became a, a yoke on me. And so my turning point, right? And my decision was, okay, what am I going to do about it now? Because the kids seen me, you know, as non-existent dad, right? He's just sitting there watching TV, you know, just letting life go by his mom, you know. And because mom's having to pick up that heavy load, she's seen as the bad guy, right? And here I am, and dad's the good guy. You know, he's the best guy on earth, you know, and that's how they seen dad. But it became a source of shame for me because there was no, nothing there for me to be proud of. Right? And so I had to make that decision, right? Michelle mentioned uh, the scripture. It says, if thou shalt hearken unto the word of the voice of God, right? And it's, isn't it interesting that those, that two-letter word, if, right? It says, if that, if my people who are called by my name. And the Lord showed me this years ago is that if, that, that first word, if, there is um, consequence or there is an outcome that will be determined by our choices and our actions, Right, And so everything in life. And so what I had to do is I had to make that decision. If I'm going to take authority over our family, over our household, over our children, then I was going to have to make that decision right then and there, right? And draw a line in the sand and say, no more. As for me and my house, this temple, I will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. Our marriages will reflect God's glory. And our children and our family will serve the Lord. You know, I love when pastor shares, he says, as the church goes, so goes the nation. Well, I like to say it like this. At the very beginning, as the man goes, so goes the marriage. As the marriage goes, so goes the family. As the family goes, so goes the church. And so on. So this is where it begins, guys. The buck stops here. Right In taking authority over what the Lord has blessed you with. He has given us stewardship over our marriages, over our families, over our spouses, and we have a work to do, really. And so we have to draw that line in the sand and say no more from this day forward. Now for me, the challenging part for me is that they, my kids were used to seeing the dad that was uh, in slumber. He wasn't doing anything. So then in my mind, I had to battle that thought of, okay, how are the kids going to perceive you as this hypocrite, right? You've lived this way all this, and now all of a sudden you're super dad, right? But I had to make that decision and it says, I don't care. I said, there's too much at risk here. I'm going to continue. Even if I make mistakes, even I, if I fail, I need to be consistent in what I want to do in order for the Lord to bless us as a family. So, you know, um, him sharing that this, uh, in Genesis, the very first book of the Bible, Genesis 4, um, you know the story of Cain and Abel. Um, uh, it says that, oh, I, I love how John shares it, share the, the scripture. And well, we know the story of Cain and Abel. They both brought an offering to the Lord. And and in Cain's offering, it, not that it was a bad offering, it's just not what the Lord required. You know, it was the first fruit, right? And this is a conversation I love between God and Cain because it really reminded me of me and who I was. Because God approached Cain and he asked him right away, he says, why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen, right? And when I thought about that story, I, again, Cain and myself, right? He brought the offering to the Lord and I thought to myself, I, this is what he must have been dealing with. Here's Cain. He bought an offering. It wasn't accepted. And he's like, I can't do anything right. 
That's him. Nothing That's what he I ever say. do is good enough. Yeah. Right? And then God responded by saying, Cain, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And then he says, and if you don't do well, sin is at your door. And it's desires to have you. But you, Cain, must rule over it. Must rule over what? The desire to not do well. The desire to sit and let this thing fester in you. That you, The feeling of feeling rejected. That nothing's ever good enough. That you're never going to be the one accepted. And God told him, it says, you must rule over it. And when I thought about myself, it says, well, if God's telling me that, then he has empowered me to rule Amen. over that desire Amen. to not do good. Yeah. And, and just so you know, in that, that verse where it says, you must rule over it, um, it's a Hebrew word and it's, I'm not going to say it the way Hebrews say it, but it says, um, it's mushal, mushal, mushal. And it says, meaning is to have dominion govern, reign, and to have power, right? So he's telling, um, he's telling Cain, you can have power over this, but you got to do it. He's, he's warning him, this is what's crouching at your door, and it desires to have you, but you must rule over it. You must take dominion over it. You must reign over this desire not to do well, right? So there's times, you know, when John talks about, because I would want him to help me out and do things. And he just always would look at it as I'm just complaining. I'm not, he's never good enough. And he just would always have that sour look that his countenance would fall because I wasn't accepting his uh, offering of laying on the couch watching football or whatever, right? So, <laughs> so, so here's the thing is that we're talking about authority, right? And I'm not saying that John and I have perfected this. I'm just saying that, Past, um, um, I was going to say Pastor Fred, but Fred, um, when he shared his lifetime scripture about, um, you know, that those who have rest in Joshua, um, go and help your brothers, right? We have rest in our marriage. We've conquered the big things, right? Now it's just maintaining some things. You know, we get in our little tiffs here and there, but we don't have those big mountains that we used to have to fight. Um, so we have entered in this place of rest. And, and with this last year, with COVID and everything, there's a lot of restless marriages. And that's what our heart is, is to come alongside of all of you and, and say, hey, we're here to help our brothers. The Bible says that, um, I love this scripture, it says um, that we... Uh, what is the scripture? Yes, thank you, Lord. Bring it back. Yes, it says that, um, that we're to help one another and in doing so, right? We're to bear one another's burdens. And in doing so, we fulfill the law of Christ. And right now with the body of Christ, um, really truly we're supposed to be a city set upon a hill whose light cannot be hid, right? We're to be the salt of the earth. Well, well, truly the church in the world's eyes has a black eye, right? And the word says that they will know you by your love for one another. Who will know you? The world will know you, right? But, but guess what? We have a black eye right now. And how can we have authority in the world, right? When we don't have authority even over our own feelings and the desire to do well, right? Think about that. So if I get mad at John, so I'm gonna just walk through a little bit of what John and I, if a lot, there's few of you here that were probably here when we literally became vulnerable and shared our testimony of what we walked through in our marriage. Um, and, and it was, it was, we went through a hard time. It was really rough. Um, but literally, um, where was I going with this? Why does this keep happening? Satan, you're a liar. I'll yes, share this little story yes, go ahead. Thinking about it. Okay, so going back to, you know, if you see Michelle and I, we've been married for 35 years, right? And that we just have this incredible marriage. We love each other so much, right? Doesn't mean that we don't go through stuff. Yes. For those of you who really don't know Michelle, she's an incredible, gifted woman of God. She preaches the word, so much word in her. But she's also an amazing, uh, she's got amazing gifts. She's a uh, home. Right, every home that we've ever lived in, whether it's an apartment or a house, she's already always made at home. I'm talking magazine worthy. I mean, she can decorate, okay? And so she's always had this high standard of everything from folding our shirts in the drawers and making, you know, setting up the couch and everything. And, and me, you know, when she used to set up perfectly, I'd go in there looking for a shirt somewhere maybe in the middle or something. And I would, you know, leave it messed up. And so I don't do that anymore, right? Yeah, he's good. Yeah. <laughs> he's learned. 
So, but I've learned to adjust because I wanted to please my wife. So I started learning how to fold the clothes the way she wanted to. You know, I was very patient with it and I got it down to a science, right? Yeah. Well, recently, about three months ago, yeah, Michelle right. bought a new comforter, right? For, the, for our bedroom, right? And if you buy a new comforter, you got to get the accessories, right? All the throw pillows and everything that comes with it, right? And so it took Michelle a little while to arrange them perfectly to where she said, okay, there it is. This is how I love it, right? And so me being the helpmate that I am, right, I would always want to make the bed. You know, I do that often, right? Yeah. And so when I started arranging the pillows, Michelle came over and she, she came over one time and said, no, 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 this is not how you do it. She wanted to show me how to do it. And I'm like, no, I said, I, I don't need this, right? I didn't need her telling me what to do, right? So what I did initially was just, I said, no, then you can do it yourself. And I walked away, yeah. right? Because I didn't, in my selfish nature, I did not want Michelle telling me how to do something, right? And that is where we talk about that desire to not do well. Well, the Holy Spirit convicted me of that. Right? And then after he convicted me, I went over and I started watching her. I didn't say anything, right? I started watching her how she was doing it. Right? <laughs> and every day I practiced it and I started arranging the pillows until I got it perfectly right. All right? And so, you know, the, the value in that story is that for me is that I was proud that I was able to do that. But that's not what brought me joy. It pleased my wife. That's what brought me real joy. Yeah. Amen. The desire to do well. Exactly. Right? And so sometimes we're like, yeah, you know, she, I'm not good enough, you know? And going back, this is what I was sharing about what we went through. A lot of you guys, uh, some of you guys were here to hear what we went through. And it was rough. Um, but during that time, we were not believers when we got, sa when we got married. Um, and it was a few years before I got saved. But in that meantime, I've always been a very strong person. I'm a very opinionated person. I will tell you like it is. I, I don't hold back. And to me, that was honesty. You know, I, I wasn't being mean. It was like, that's the truth. And that's the brutal truth. And you just need to deal with it, you know? And so I just had that kind of attitude. And so, so I used to be that way. So what happens is, is that in marriage, right? Um, you're going to see all, there's nothing greater than a, a relationship. The greatest, the greatest commandment God has given us is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. The second is like the first, to love your neighbor as yourself, right? There's no greater relationship that will teach you how to love your neighbor um, is this neighbor right here, your spouse. That's where it's taught. Iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another, right? This is where it happens. And a lot of times people think, oh, they just get on my nerves. So yes, when you don't have counsel and you don't have that godly wisdom and you don't take the word of God and bind it on your heart, keep it as the apple of your eye, guess what? You, you can fall into those traps. And that's what happened. Proverbs 5, I love it. It talks about my son. Keep my commandment. Bind them on your heart. Keep it on, to keep you from the horse women and the flattering of our eyelids. It goes Goes on listing all this stuff, and I'm like, oh my gosh, the Bible says that, right? But during that time, he was a man void of understanding and not knowing that um, that uh, the way to her house is to the depths of hell, right? Um, but it's because at home he didn't feel like he was like Cain, you know. Um, his countenance had fallen because I was griping and complaining all the time. So let me interject there. Yeah. When she says that I was a man void of understanding, we have two different versions or two different definitions, right? <laughs> No, no, and seriously, is that a void of understanding, but for me, I was void of understanding the consequences yes. or repercussions of my actions. That's all of it, yes. Yeah. It's true. I think we, and I think it can be anything, void of understanding of the consequences, um, understanding, like, that's a spirit, and it's trying to, like, to bring division, you know? So... Going after that, um, walking through all of those things and seeing in Proverbs 5, I, I really would like really truly um, say you guys need to read Proverbs 5, all of it, the whole thing. Because um, there's in it, uh, it was um, Solomon who says, you know, that um, because 
later on in life, they see, wow, I never listened to my teachers. And I come to this place, and now that I've given my years to the wicked one, right, um, and, and my wealth to a foreigner, says so now I slap my knee and be like, wow, why didn't I listen to my, my teachers? Why didn't I listen to those that warned me that this path will, will lead to destruction? Um, I'm going to pop up my notes because I want to go after authority. Um, the word authority... Um, actually means power to influence or command thought, opinion, or behavior, right? Um, and you know we're a body, soul, and spirit, right? And so thought is our, and our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. In our mind, the enemy wants to come in and drop a thought. And that we, I, I love the scripture, the song they were singing about not coming into agreement, like not coming into agreement with, with the enemy. Because the Bible said, how can two walk together unless they be agreed upon? And so, so when the enemy comes and brings that thought, right, you can rule over that thought. That's why the Bible says to cast down every wicked thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And I love this part. This is where the authority lies, okay? You guys have to hear this. This is where it lies. It says, in being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So if you're not taking thoughts captive in your secret place, because the Bible says, um, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It lists this host of benefits of those who dwell in under the shadow of the Almighty. But a lot of times people in their secret place they got other things they're worshiping, right? They're not worshiping the Lord, their God. And that's why they don't have that authority. They don't have that blessing. They don't have that covering because they're doing that. I love, um, even in the script, the song, they, the scripture was up on there about, you know, no weapon formed against us will prosper. Um, every tongue that rises against us will be brought to shame, right? But then it says in the Amplified Bible, this is the inheritance of those whom the perfect servant is reproduced in. So what God is wanting is he wants his character reproduced in us, right? So that no weapon formed against us will prosper. But did you give a right for that weapon to come against you? Did you open the door for the enemy to come against you? Um, do you want to go or do you want me to? I, I have this scripture. I have this scripture. Go ahead. So I'm going to say right here, um, uh, Romans, Romans, Romans 10, 5 is talking about casting down imagination, right? So when you do that, it says that when your obedience is fulfilled, you have authority to punish disobedient people, right? You can speak. There's been, there was a time I was in Europe visiting my kids. They were all pairing there and there was a couple of situations that happened. And I, because I was there, I ended up doing something and commanding this guy literally on a train. He was acting crazy. He was huge and he was acting crazy. I told him to sit down now, right? And my daughters knew I was going to say something, but everybody was afraid of him and everybody was coming to our part of the, the train. And, um, and I literally turned and my daughter looked at me and she shook her. She goes, mom, no. No. And I, I turned around and I was so bothered because he was, he was literally um, infusing that car that we were on with fear. And so I had my arm around my, my youngest daughter. I turned around and looked at him and yelled, hey. And he stopped and he turned around and looked at me. I said, sit down now. And that man, as big as he was, who could have physically beat me up, right, ran and sat down on the chair and stayed there. And there was another situation. So I'm like, God, and John's like, babe, you need to be careful. You're in a foreign land. I'm like, I'm like, God, am I being... No, you, gotta, you have to finish the story when the, when the train stopped. Oh, yeah. When the train stopped, the, the man, he was, he was tormented, you could tell. Um, but when the train stopped, um, literally, it did come to me before it stopped. Like, my back was facing him, and it did come to me. This thought came to me that he's going to get up and he's going to attack you, you know? Um, and I, out loud, not enough for everybody to hear, but I said, Satan, you're a liar. You have no authority here. You have no authority, right, is what I said. Um, I'm not, not knowing. I just did it because it was in me to do it. So then the train stops. The man bolts out of the train doors. We were on the tube train in London, and he slams his body against the wall, right? The whole train is like, <gasps> like gasping at what he did. So there was a couple situations like that that had happened, and my husband said, babe, you need to be careful. And I just asked the Lord, am I being stupid? Like, am I really being stupid that I'm doing 
doing these things. Um, but I didn't feel scared. I really truly didn't. And so God took me through this and he took me through that, through 10-5. And God showed me that, Michelle, you're not perfect, but I know who you serve in your secret place, right? Do you know when, when um, uh, Paul, them, um, it, was, it was these brothers, the seven sons of Sceva, if you guys know that story, they went to try to cast out demons out of a man because they saw Paul doing it, right? <laughs> They're like, oh, we're gonna go do this. And it's seven brothers, seven brothers um, go to cast out a demon and the demon turned into... Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And the demon came out and whipped those boys' butts, right? Um, literally whipped them. Look, at, here's this one woman sitting on a train that literally with my words, I spoke to him to sit down and he obeyed me. He obeyed me. So I asked the Lord, what is that about? Am I being foolish? But God took me through this. He said, because in your secret place, you honor me. You're not perfect, Michelle, but you honor me. You're not living a double life, right? You've not allowed the enemy into your secret place. You cast down thoughts. You take thoughts captive. I don't have like unforgiveness in my heart. When there is, I go after it. I don't allow it because that's what it is. And then it says here in Romans um, uh, 15, 15, Paul says, I dare not speak about something God has not worked out in me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient. Look at that. That's authority, right? So we can talk a talk, right? But when our walk doesn't line up with the talk, the enemy knows it and he has authority and he'll come in and say, you know what? Yeah. And he can attack your mind with thoughts. And, 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 he, and, and the Bible says, go ahead. I'm gonna let you go ahead and share this one, babe. Um, you want me to go? You want me, you want me to do it? Okay, yeah. What was I going to share? <laughs> oh, um, it was just about how can a strong man, how can, yes. yeah, how can, I'll let you, here, the Bible says, how can a thief enter a strong man's, strong man's house? house? Yes. Unless he first binds up the strong man and steal his goods. Yes, right? And that's, that's the enemy's, uh, that, that's his plan, is to bind us up as men. Yes. Because if he has us all bound up, guess what? Our family is prey, our wives, our children, mm -hmm. everything that we have. But then in the book of Matthew, it says when the strong man, mm -hmm. in the book of Luke, I'm sorry, when the strong man is fully guarded, guards his own house, his possessions and properties remain undisturbed and secure. Yes. That's where the power is. And so when we talk about, okay, how do we take back the authority in our lives? Regardless of whatever, where we're at, even if it's the smallest, minute things, how do we take authority back? And it begins in getting back in right standing with the Lord. But you have to defend, define what that means because it cannot be our own version of right. Amen? Because in the book of Proverbs, it says twice. It says, there's a way that seems right to a man and appears straight before him, but in the end is the way of death. It says it twice. And so there's an emphasis on that, right? And the word also says, be not wise in your own eyes, right? Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your body and strength to your bones. Right? And it and begins in our secret places. Yes, the secret place. That's the place that God comes after. That fire. There's a, there's a, um, you know the story of, um, it is in Leviticus, I believe, but it's the story of Aaron's sons offering strange fire on the altar, right, is what it says. Um, and the first time I read it, I just thought, wow, God, you're mean. You're mean because he sent out fire and killed his sons because they offered strange fire on the altar. I was a, I was a, a, a new believer when I said that, but I asked the Lord, what was that all about? Why did you do that? Why did you allow that to happen? Why did you destroy his sons? Um, and one of the things that, um, that had happened, I started reading about strange fire, you know, and um, the book of Talmud, well, it actually is the, first, the original fire that was put on the altar was literally was a miracle. God started the fire on the altar and it was to be burning. The, the law was it was to be burning both day and night, day and night. It was to never, ever be put out. Um, and if by any calamity it was put out, the only way it can be brought back was by friction, okay? Um, and any other way would be, quote unquote, considered strange fire and punishable by death is what it says. So when we invited Christ into our hearts, right, he was the one who started that fire, 
right? And it's our job daily to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing unto the Lord, right? So daily, the Bible says, if you're my disciples, what? You take up your cross daily and deny yourself, right? So cross is a symbol of affliction. So when you're afflicted um, to not do well, right? Not do well. When you're afflicted to not do well, resist, resist right? Desire. That's what it is. It's to put to death your flesh. Like literally, um, the Bible says there's no good thing that dwells in the flesh. It's constant enmity against the spirit of God. So, and a lot of people like to think, you know, oh, I can, I can go to church on Sunday and live a, a certain way because God is grace. We have car insurance for a reason, just in case an accident. Go run your car into everybody you want to. Guess what? They'll drop you like a hot potato because now you, you become a like risk, a liability. A yes, exactly. A high risk driver. And so God's grace is there for mistakes, not for premeditated sin. And so that's the thing that I think the church has lost, right? That we, we talk the talk, but our deeds don't line up. So Paul says, I won't preach about something that God has not worked out in me in word and deed. Indeed, that's why you hear so many believers, not believers, the world, but even some believers that have fallen away from the church. They're hypocrites. They're hypocrites. They're hypocrites because they saw it, right? They saw it. They saw the phoniness. The world knows what's phony and what's genuine. And the genuineness of our faith, right, that's tried is more precious than silver and gold. So it's tried by what? Fire. Fire. And, and, and I know I'm, do you want me to keep going? We're out of time. <laughs> Are we really? We're getting there. It came, we knew it was going to happen fast because we have so much in us. But here, I'm going to share this. When, um, in, uh, in, Matthew, um, in Matthew 4, I believe it was, um, it says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. This is John talking. He says, but he who comes is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So it's the fire, when the fire in our life, the Bible says in, um, uh, yes, I'll, I'll tell you that I know where it's at, but it says, beloved, think it not strange concerning this fiery trial, which has come to try you as though some strange thing has happened unto you, but rejoice in as much as you are partakers in Christ's suffering. So the, 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 the desire to not do well is to say, you know what? Yeah, I can get mad at my wife for saying that or I can get mad at my husband. Yeah, this guy at work is looking at me and talking to me and saying stuff to me that my husband don't even say, right? So that desire to be like, you know what? My countenance has fallen because he isn't making me feel good. Um, so this guy's saying something. So the desire, right, to not do well is there. It's always there. It's crouching at your door. So right away when things happen, it's important to immediately forgive. Um, you know, where it says, how can a thief enter a straw man's house unless he binds up the straw man? I think tonight is a good time to evaluate what are you bound with? It, we think binding up something, um, maybe drugs, alcohol, adultery, all these different things. But there is also too, um, there's um, unforgiveness, right? That's a huge thing is unforgiveness. When you uh, um, esteem yourself above everybody else, selfishness, right? Self-pity. Those are all sins that we need to go after and that God needs to replace yourself, right, on the throne of your heart with him. He should be on the throne of your heart. He should be dwelling in that secret place. Not you, not like I want to, she made me mad, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go please my flesh. I'm going to go do something to make her mad. And in, in, your, in your secret place, you're like, yeah, I got her back. I have the upper hand, right? But really, it's a lie because your desire to not do well just took over. You didn't rule over it. And guess what? The enemy has authority over you. Does that make sense? Do you guys understand that? Amen. Amen. So let me tie this up, wrap it up real quick here. <laughs> and so for me, if I'm asked, how do I take back authority in my life? It begins again with being in right standing with the mm -hmm. Lord, right? And allowing the Lord to deal with the number one area of my life, which is probably pride, which keeps me from loving my wife the way I need to as I need to submit unto the Lord and recognize her giftings. Mm. 
You know, it's interesting today, we kind of, we, we were battling it out, you know, we we're like, okay, Michelle's got these notes, I'm gonna let her know, okay, I got these notes, how are we gonna mesh, how are we gonna, you know, how's the transition gonna look like in this? And when we come up here, and I'm just in total awe listening to my wife, and the Holy Spirit using her to minister the word. And that brings me so much joy. I have just killed that area of pride in my life. So now I'm standing right with the Lord. Amen. 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 So now just a testimony in that is before he would be like, you know, babe, when you start, like, you got to like, give me some time to talk. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, babe, but you know, just say something, say something to me, like say something. And I'm not trying. Yeah. Eye contact. Um, <laughs> Because sometimes I, I, you don't plan on doing certain things, but when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of it, I'm like, okay, babe, I will do my best. And I felt like I was being put in a box, like, okay, I can't say this, or I can't do this, wait, wait, I can't, no, no, I can't tell that story, I can't do this, you know? I just would feel all these things, but for him to say that, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And then I told him today, we prayed and said, because sometimes, you know, the competition, it was in Genesis, that was the curse, right? That, you know, you guys will, like, your desire is to, like, like have dominion over one another, right? Um, but your husband's going to rule over you, you know? Um, that same thing, that ruling. But I'm like, God, I want to submit to that. I want to know. And I, I like so honor him. He is a beautiful, beautiful man. Yes, we walk through hell. We walk through fires. But guess what? It purified us. It purified us. And today we have a testimony. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Okay. Final thing, and I promise. Yeah. I set my eyes upon the hill. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. This is my helpmate from the Lord. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above, and she is mine. Amen. Thank you, guys. You know what? Can I share one no. last thing? One last thing, because this one get last, the last thing. Word in. <laughs> this one last thing is, you know how we perceive people is how we treat them, right? So if you perceive your helpmate as your enemy, you treat them like your enemy. And Come you on. need to know that God has called your spouse. That's a whole sermon right there. That, that, right? right? It time. is. <laughs> so tonight, just, I promise you, I mean, we felt like I had, I feel like we both had so much in us. We were like, God, we only have this much time, right, to give it. And so we pray that what we shared um, will have come in. You know, his word is sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing and dividing of soul and spirit like bone and marrow. Going after the thought and intent of his heart. So I know I threw out a lot of scriptures and John did too. But maybe, I don't know if they tape this, you can go back and read those scriptures. Meditate on it, right? Day and night. You'll be like a tree planted by living waters whose leaf does not wither. Whatever you touch will be blessed, right? That's what it says. And that's what God wants for you. But looking at that and saying, God, go after the thought and intents of my heart and go after those things that are circumcision, that excess flesh. God, I want it gone. Is circumcision, uncircumcision, availeth nothing. It is circumcision of the heart and that's what God is after. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Not how we scripted it, okay? Awesome. Everybody, please give a, a applause for John and Michelle Cormina. That was an incredible, credible message. That is a truly anointed couple. And we when I just... grow up, I want to be as free as she is <laughs> in the Word of God. You are so blessed. You both are so blessed. Amen. So blessed to flow like that, to have the liberty and the freedom to bless so many people. Yeah. I just want to say thank you. Incredible. Incredible. Well, hey, everybody, I know that we're drawing close to the end, but I promised you guys a special surprise, specifically for the guys that, 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 that are here. Right? So, so I'm looking for a special couple. Um, is he a fan? Ah. The Vickers, please. Please come up. All right. So I will tell you, my wife will tell you, there's not many things that I'm scared of. But there was one thing that, I had, that scared me, and that was my wedding day. I, I will tell you that because I realized the commitment that would come and the responsibilities that come with that. And so today, everybody, we're going to recommit ourselves to our spouses. So with that, can I have everybody stand up? Yep. If you can face your spouse, 
if you can, please take off your wedding ring and give it to your spouse. If you can't, that's okay. <laughs> All right, and Pastor Jim, I turn it over to you. Amen. I just have one quick question. How many pillows is too many? <laughs> Amen. What, what an opportunity. I'm going to move these because I actually want to do this with my wife. So uh, as he said, if you can take your rings off, take your ring off and hand it to your spouse. And uh, I want to do the affirmation part. So um, I'm going to ask uh, this question and uh, you'll just repeat this after me. So gentlemen, please first, um, take your wife's hands if you have not already. Look into her eyes. I'll ask you this question at the end. The gentleman will say, if they agree, I will. Amen? So, will you have this woman to be your covenant wife? To live together after God's ordinance in the holiest state of matrimony? Will you love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health and forsaking all others? Will you keep yourself uh, unto her alone so long as you both shall live? If so, say, I will. I will. Ladies, looking into your husband's eyes, will you have this man to be your covenant husband, to live together after God's ordinance in the holiest state of matrimony? Will you love him, comfort him, honor and keep him in sickness and in health and forsaking all others will you keep yourself unto him alone so long as you both shall live if so say I will, I will. amen here's some passion points with the vows okay men now take uh, I want you to repeat this after me and I'm going to say it to my wife, Michelle. So I'm going to say our names, but you replace our names with your names. Amen? <laughs> so I, Jim, take thee, Michelle, to be my covenant wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part, according to God's holy ordinance, in there too, I pledge my love to you. Ladies, in the same way, I'm gonna say our names, you, re you replace your names for ours. I, Michelle, take thee, Jim, to be my covenant husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part, according to God's holy ordinance, in there too. I pledge, my love to you. I pledge my love to you. Okay, the rings. Gentlemen, take your wife's ring and place it on her finger and repeat this after me. With this ring, I thee wed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Ladies, take your husband's ring and place it on his finger. And repeat this after me. With this ring, I thee wed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please join me in prayer and as, as I speak a blessing over the marriages tonight. Lord, I ask that you pour your blessings over each couple here tonight. May each marriage bring them all the fulfillment of that a marriage should bring. And may the love of the Lord give each couple patience, tolerance, and understanding. May their union be full of joy and laughter 
as well as comfort and support. May each of you discover the true depth of love through loving one another. Always remember that every burden is easier to carry when you have the shoulders of two instead of one. When you are weary and discouraged, look to Jesus to refresh and strengthen you. May you always need one another, not so much to fill an emptiness, but to help you know your fullness. May you always need one another, but not to in out of weakness. Rejoice in and praise one another's uniqueness. For God is the creator of both male and female and the differences in personalities. Be faithful to one another in your thoughts and deeds. And above all, be faithful to Jesus. May you see your marriage bed as an altar of grace and pleasure. May you remember that each time that you speak to one another, you are talking to someone that God has claimed and considers very special. View and treat your partner as one created in the image of God. Remember that you are not to hold your mate captive, but to give your spouse the freedom to become all that God wants. May you embrace and hold one another as God holds you. May God renew your minds so that you will draw out the best in the potential in, in one another. Look for things to praise. Never take one another for granted. And may you both often say, I love you. And take no notice of little faults. Affirm one another. Defer to one another. And believe in your partner. If you have a different issue or an issue that pushes you apart, May both of you have the good sense to take the first step back. May the phrases, you're right, forgive me, and I forgive you, be close at hand. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the presence that you have brought here tonight. Lord, we thank you for always being with each couple. And may you pour out your blessings upon each marriage here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if not, you're not already doing this, take your wife's hands and join me as a, representant, a representative of Jesus Christ before God Almighty in the name of the Father and of the Son and by the power of the Holy Spirit. I now pronounce each marriage renewed. Gentlemen, you may kiss your bride. Amen. Thank you.